Today we will be um, thinking about and remembering and giving thanks for Elizabeth, our late Queen, and thinking a little about and praying for our new King Charles. So uh, there are some variations in the service today to fit in with all of that. Everything you need for the service is on the screen and the large bold print is your opportunity to participate in the prayers and make them your own. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus said, This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. The Lord be with you. And also with you. From the Gospel today we hear these words. I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. We pray together. O oh God, without you we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that the Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. 
O God. Exalted, you bring home the found. Touch our hearts with grateful wonder at the tenderness of your forbearing love. Grant us the light in the mercy that has found us and bring all to rejoice at the feast of forgiven sinners. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, <coughs> theme prayer for remembering Elizabeth, our Queen. O God, by whose grace your servant Elizabeth became a burning and shining light for your church, grant that we also may be aflame with the spirit of love and discipleship, and with her walk before you as children of light, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be comfortable as we listen to Scripture. <coughs> first lesson this morning is from Timothy chapters 1 to 2, uh, I'm asking, sorry, uh, verses 1 to 2, 3 to 11, chapter 12 to 9a from the uh, New Revised Version of the Bible. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Saviour, and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my loyal child in faith, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I urge you, as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia, to remain in Ephesus, that you may instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless geologies that promote speculation rather than the divine training that is known by faith. But the aim of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience and sincere faith. Some people have deviated from these and turn to mean, meaningless talk, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they are making assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it legitimately. This means understanding the law is laid down not for the innocent but for the lawlessness and disobedient, for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which is entrusted to me. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the foremost. But for that very reason I receive mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him 
for eternal life. To the King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. I am giving you these instructions, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies that made earlier about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in the faith. Among them, Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have turned over to Satan, so that they may learn not to blaspheme. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Stay there, Rosemary. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together all his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp and sweeps the house and searches carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God, over one sinner who repents. For the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
Come Holy Spirit, come and open our hearts and minds that we might hear you afresh today, hear you anew. And go from this place to be a light by which you draw others to yourself. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be comfortable. I, I imagine like you, um, you've been glued to your television sets for large parts of the last couple of days regarding the things around the death of our Queen Elizabeth II. And then, of course, yesterday, the, the work of, of proclamation of King Charles III. Been doing that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have to admit, um, I, I have to kind of turn it off every now and then because I, I really was finding it actually quite emotional. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised about how, how emotional I was finding it. Um, and it was surprising that it was, it was a Republican by the name of what's his name, Kevin Rudd, who actually put in words for me what was going on emotionally. He said, it's like we've lost our grandmother. And, and along with the fact that I lost my, my own mum um, at the beginning of this year, and that's all caught up in there because I found myself in all those sorts of things. So thinking, oh, I want to see how mum's going. What's mum thinking about this? There's a part of me that's saying, well, she's probably talking with the Queen up there, so it's no problem, really. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, I'm, and I'm quite surprised about, about the responses that has been taking place, but, you know, regarding those who, who are Republicans and those who, who, who don't think the monarchy should be a part of our Constitution and those sorts of things, and how positive they were about who she was not just for England, not just for the United Kingdom. Even those who, are part, who, who have a history in Ireland are talking about how wonderful, wonderful she was. And then, and then it kind of expands into the whole idea of the Commonwealth. And, and then too I was surprised by the leaders of nations of the world that aren't a part of that oversight that she had in the Commonwealth and in the realm and in the UK, talking about how awesome she was as a woman. I, I was really particularly impressed by the, um, the the Prime Minister of Canada, who talked about her being, you know, the best person he'd ever known. And I found myself reflecting on the role of this particular woman in all of these years that most of us have only known her, nobody else. I don't think there's anyone old enough here who knew King George. No. You did? There you go. Here I was paying compliments about how, how young you all were. <laughs> Lost that one, didn't I? <laughs> Well, let's not push that one too hard. Let's just take the compliment I was trying to offer. <laughs> well, we're too young to really. <laughs> but I think the one thing that sort of struck me in about all of this was in her role, how much of a focus of unity that she was, not just for England, not just for the United Kingdom, not just for the Commonwealth, not just for the realm of which we are part of, but for the whole world. And we know, too, that she was a woman of profound faith. Uh, and I, I, was, I was reflecting through this whole process about how uh, evangelistic her Christmas messages had become in the, in, the, in the later years. That she was quite open to sharing what it is that she believed and expressed that. You know, she, whenever... Um, I forgot what his name is now. was in town... She would get him around to, to preach and talk about scripture and stuff with him. It'll come to me in a moment, probably at the end of the sermon. Um, but, but that whole kind of sense that, that, that she was active in her faith. And it's this sense of unity which I find myself thinking about as we move into the next stage and hoping that, that King Charles is going to be the same and King Charles will continue. Well, I think King Charles will be the same because he talks about himself being, if you like, the defender of the faiths 
not the defender of the faith, which the Queen understood as Christianity. Um, um, I, I think it'd be good for us to pray because I don't know where Charles is in terms of his of, of his faith, and to pray to when we say God save the King, let us that be a prayer for us in that kind of sense. And I found myself connecting this idea of, of, of unity, as we've seen it in our Queen, with this disunity that's been taking place within our communion, the communion over which she was head. And the struggle we are having with that disunity within our community, fundamentally over differences in how we read and study scripture, particularly regarding actively same-sex attracted clergy, same-sex marriages and same-sex marriage blessings by and within the church. Let me try and put this in perspective. I'm going to use language which is sort of the theological language. I describe myself as being a, what I call a systematic theologian. That means I draw in from a whole lot of different areas, you know, including obviously biblical theology. But reading the scripture, um, I read through both lenses of tradition, that which we've inherited from before, but also my experience of God in the world and in my own life. So it's a system of theology, if you like. It seems to me that if we continue with just the lens of tradition, we can become set in scripture. This is what they said in the past, therefore that's what we say now. And I don't think that stands up to scrutiny. Because I think if we experience God in life, it invites us to do a theology, to build on what has been inherited, sometimes to challenge the tradition that we've inherited, or to build upon it. And the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin in the Gospel reading today are examples of if we get into thinking about what these scripture passages mean in their context, it kind of challenges the tradition that we've come to understand them to mean. So what have you understood the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin to mean? Oh, thank you for doing my sermon for me, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> because I remember hearing that these were, were this was a, a story about pastoral care that it was my responsibility, if anybody left the church, I need to go and seek them out, find them and bring them back. Also about evangelism. It's about helping people to repent and come to the Lord. I find those inadequate now as I reflect on them. So uh, uh, bringing theology or the work of theology to those things helps us to think about them in the context. And so I want to do that for a moment just to get to, to Carol's sermon about <laughs> what's going on here. Note that Jesus is actually addressing the Pharisees in, in this particular sense. Which one of you, he's saying, which one of you, which one of you Pharisees who are grumbling about me hanging out with and, and eating with sinners? And which one of you, having lost a sheep, will leave the rest of the sheep and go and look for it? And which one of you, having found that lost sheep, will then put it on your shoulders and carry it home? And which one of you will then celebrate with your friends and neighbours because you have found the lost sheep? What's the Pharisee's response? Are you kidding me? They wouldn't do such a thing. Completely illogical. Completely crazy. They must think this shepherd is an absolute loon. This shepherd is absolutely crazy. He is crazy because he leaves the rest, the 99 of his sheep behind with the possibility of losing more in order to go and find one that's got lost. This shepherd is absolutely crazy because he puts the sheep on his shoulders and carries it home. Are you kidding me? This shepherd must be absolutely crazy because he's concerned about this particular sheep. What's going on here? Well, I think it would have been clear to, to the Pharisees that Jesus was making a reference about God being the shepherd. So this parable isn't, I don't think, about pastoral care. I don't think it is about evangelism. 
This parable is comparing the Pharisees who were stuck in the tradition, stuck in the tradition of the law, and they're using that to determine who is and who is out. But what's going on here, the story that Jesus is saying is, this is your crazy God, and your God is crazy about you. Your God is crazily in love with you, even though you are the most annoying people I've ever met. Likewise, the parable of the lost coin continues to force the Pharisees and those who are listening to think. And Jesus has a woman who has lost a coin. And she would light a lamp and search the entire house until she finds it. And the Pharisees again are going to think, this woman is crazy. Why don't you wait for daylight? You don't have to light the lamp. You clean the house anyway, so you should know where it is. She must be desperate for the coin. I can't, I can't even help thinking that Pharisees might be thinking, this is crazy. This is a woman. I'm talking about the Pharisees, not me. I hope you know that it's not true about me. The Pharisees. God cares about women? Well, the answer is this God of ours is crazy enough to care about women too. God is crazily, these parables, God is crazily in love with you and with me. Even though we're not perfect. Even though we let the sinful nature get the better of us. Even though we are sinners. And Christ died for us. God will search us out. And when we turn back to him, that's what repent means. It means turning back to God. And the whole heavenly court rejoices and celebrates when we respond to God's crazy love for us. And that seems to me to be a fundamental message of the gospel. That's it. God is crazily in love with you and will do any, the most crazy things in order to draw us back into his love. God may hate the things we do and, th and think and say, and the things that we do that damage our relationship with God, with others and with ourselves. But he is crazily in love with each and every one of us and will search and search and search until he finds us and we are found in him. And this, I think, is the basic gospel of Paul's instruction to Timothy and why he's telling him to remain in Ephesus and to teach those who are stuck in the doctrine of law and that this is the sincere faith that comes from a pure heart and a good conscience. And in reading scripture and interpreting what it's saying for us today, we need to apply this attitude of a pure heart and good conscience. What attitude? That God is crazily in love with you and me and everybody else, whatever we think of them. And so Paul then goes on to list those laws laid down to describe which are godless and sinful for the unholy and the profane, suggesting a connection with the instructions, believe it or not, I think, hooking into those instructions in Leviticus, which are warning the people of Israel the right way to worship God, not to fall into the trap of the, of the Baals and, and, and those uh, fertility religions in Canaan where they would go off and have sex in the temple to worship particularly regarding the male and and male with male and female with female prostitution temple prostitution that's taking place because clearly it's not lawful to kill your father or your mother or any other human being for that matter all right why is that for us the most punishable law, do you think? Because God gives life. Because God gives life and we can't take it away. 
which is one of the reasons we don't have that gassing people to death and hanging them anymore and all that kind of business. Yeah. But you can't reconcile when you've murdered somebody because they're dead. You can't fix the problem. Oh, I find myself wondering whether, whether we're the ones that actually define what's sinful and what's not. But certainly we are the ones that grade things being sinful. We say these things are more sinful than other things. For God, a sin is a sin is a sin. And which is interesting because in this list of things that he, he puts in as, as un, unholiness and profanity, he's got fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars. Hands up those of you who have not lied. Exactly. So you're as bad as anything. A sin is a sin is a sin as far as God's concerned. We're the ones that put the levels of sinfulness on there. Perjurers. Well, I've never perjured because I haven't been, because that's one of those legal terms, isn't it? And I've never been in a situation where I've borne false witness. Although you could argue that that's kind of a bit like lying anyway when you're telling somebody else about somebody else who's not good. But he goes on and he clarifies whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. In other words, God is crazily in love with you anyway. The blessed gospel. God is crazily in love with you. Sometimes it's good to go back to the Greek of of the biblical text and I remind you that I am not a biblical scholar by any means I have to rely on a whole lot of other people to help me in this particular way and I don't think I don't think often that the English translation we've got in scripture is particularly helpful sometimes <coughs> um, so but, um, what is actually listed here are activities that are concerned with using human life and sexuality as something to be bought and sold. It is about the commodification of human life. And I see that going on within our society too, when, when people will pay money to get a baby from overseas and all that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a human life that's being bought, those sorts of things. A wise person once wrote, we have come to love things and use people rather than love people and use things. And in, the, in this list, a particular current re revelance, revelance, relevance for our church life is that word that's translated here as sodomy. And it's being used as a justification of prohibition of homosexuality and the rejection of those who are same-sex attracted and those who support same-sex attraction through marriages and blessings. But I don't think sodomy is a very good translation in my skilled biblical knowledge. <laughs> Firstly, it's a word Paul has invented. It does not equate to classical Greek. It is a word he has invented because Greek is his second language and as my experience in, is in as conversation, having conversations with, with uh, South Sudanese whose language, whose English may even be a third language because they probably know Kaswahili better than they know, they know English, will make up words and I have to read between the lines to work out what it is they're saying. Here Paul has created a word. So we don't actually know what Paul means here. Here in, in Timothy, as it's just been read for us, the RSV translates the word as peter, peterists, which means what? You think, children? I don't know about you, but I go towards children. Yeah. <coughs> and in particular, it's just, it is male children. But we need to be careful that the culture that 
that's being written in here is is that um, having sex we're not talking about pedophiles here because having sex with with what's uh, a weaker or effeminate read minor in the Roman world was not illegal as it is in ours mm -hmm. nor is there any sense of it being unconsented in 1 Corinthians 6 10 however the same word is translated as sodomy and I think that leads us to as an understanding that we really don't know what Paul means by this word that he's made up in the Corinthians reference it has that kind of sense of someone in a lesser or un unequal relationship but in the context of prostitution so it's a possible way of understanding this word in, in, in our times, in our culture, we might be actually speaking of rent boys, as they're known in, in that particular, those particular circles. So Paul is concerned about sex between males, and clearly probably sex between females too. The context suggests that he's more concerned with the sin of money around that. For Paul, it seems a greater sin the greatest sin is not so much homosexuality, but male prostitution. About the commodification of human life and sexuality. So therefore, to, relate, to translate the word purely as sodomy, purely sex between two men, is inconsistent with the context at best and dishonest at worst. So whatever we might think about homosexuality, the important point to make is all things we do think and say that damage our relationship with God, with others, and even with ourselves, those things that we call sins, are forgivable through Christ. There are other sins listed here that we've all done from time to time. They are forgivable because even in our sinfulness, even in our brokenness, even if we're struggling with our identity, even if we're living with an unclear, confused gender, God is crazily in love with us. There is nothing we can do that will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We should never use scriptures as a means by which we exclude others from God's crazy love for us all. And I think we see that in Queen Elizabeth and her life not just for her people but throughout the world and because of her faith and because of that witness she's given I think it's right that we think of her as a saint and we celebrate her today the Lord be with you
kneel as comfortable as we come to pray for the world and for the church. We pray for all the peoples of the world. Continue your hold before you, South Sudan, and Iraq, Afghanistan, and Ukraine, Pakistan, where there is conflict or where there is natural disaster. So we pray together. Loving God, we give you thanks that we wander far from you. You lead us back to your way of truth. Look in mercy on your world and teach us to live in harmony with one another. We pray for your holy Catholic Church. We thank you for the role of the Queen as a head of the Church of England. And we hold before you King Charles as he takes up that role. Thank you for the unity that she revealed to us and for those who are direct lines of unity for your church here in Australia, for Jeff our primate, for Philip our archbishop, for Kate our bishop. We pray that we may be a church that is open and welcoming to all that here and amongst us they may know that your crazy love for, for them. And so we pray together. Loving God, we give you thanks, thanks that you come to find us, not in anger, but with outstretched arms. <coughs> Look in mercy on your church and teach us together to share your good news in the world. We pray for all with whom we share our lives, for our families, our neighbours and our friends. And so we pray together, loving God, we give you thanks that you have shown us your ways of love and acceptance. Look in mercy on our communities and teach us to be a community where love and care are found. We pray for all in need. Holding before you today, John, Shirley, Melinda, Matthew, Carol, Justin, Gideon, and those that we don't know, that you know, and they have no one to pray for them. So we pray together. Loving God, we give you thanks that you seek out the lost and care for the lonely. Look in mercy on those who suffer and teach us to bring tenderness and comfort to your people. We give you thanks for your faithful people who have gone before us. Remembering Elizabeth, our Queen. So we pray. Loving God, we give you thanks that you are ever ready to receive your children, rejoicing to welcome us from death to life, looking mercy on all who have died, especially those who have taught us the way of faith. May we with these your saints 
come home to find our place with you and join in the celebration with all who love you. Loving God, accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God shows his love for us in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us then show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done. And we have done those things that we ought not to have done. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us sinners, sparing those who confess their faults, restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to humanity in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most blessed Father, for what you say, that we may live a disciplined, righteous, and godly life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you're able, would you stand with me as those who know God's forgiveness can stand in his presence. God is love and those who live in love live in God and God lives in them. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
Bless thy you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and then grace. For glory and honour be yours always and everywhere, mighty creator, ever living God. We give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. And now we give you thanks because you have called us into the fellowship of our late Queen Elizabeth II and all your saints, and set before us the example of their witness and the fruit of your Spirit in their lives. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Now, gracious Father, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine and pray that we who receive them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, according to our Saviour's word, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may share his body and blood. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup and again giving you thanks he gave it to his disciples saying drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You have gathered us together to remember all Christ has done for us. We recall the, the death of your Son, Jesus Christ. We proclaim his resurrection and ascension, and we look with expectation for his coming again. Father, as we recall his saving death and glorious resurrection, May we who share these gifts be renewed by your Holy Spirit and united in the body of your Son. Bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, there to feast at your table and join in your eternal promise. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. As this broken bread was once many grains, which have been gathered together and made one bread, so may your church be gathered on the ends of the earth in your kingdom. So come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, in remembrance that he lived, died, and rose again for us, and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God, the source of all holiness, may we who have shared at this table as strangers and pilgrims on earth be welcomed with Queen Elizabeth and all your saints to the heavenly feast in your kingdom. Father, Father we, we offer, offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through the Jesus Christ our Lord. Send, Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Amen. <coughs> well, there can't be much wrong with sex because the insects are having a... <laughs> anyway, um, I don't think I've got much much to tell you just just to bring you up to speed with with John um, John had a collapse on Friday and um, Lee phoned me uh, last night just to bring me up to speed that uh, that uh, possibly a stroke that he's had and so he's having MRI and those kinds of stuff hopefully going to be home on Tuesday so that's the plan so just be keeping John in your prayers and Rosary coping without John being the guiding light for him in everything. Yeah, you're missing him like crazy, I imagine. Yeah. Bet you are. Is there anything else we need to know? Yes? It's our silver wedding on Tuesday. Oh, come on oh. down. Oh, wow. Silver wedding on Tuesday. Tuesday. Wow. Tuesday. Wow. Tuesday. Silver, that's a bit tinny, really, isn't it? <laughs> Best, we can Best you can manage at your age, yeah. Yes. <laughs> if you were younger, you'd be fine. Yes, yes. Only God knows how I've put up with it for that long. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have said that if I was me. <laughs> Guess who's not getting any lunch today? <laughs> You'll never learn, will you, Paul? No. <laughs> <laughs> we pray for them? Yes. Loving God, we thank you for Paul and Frieda, and we thank you for all that they do in our midst, and the sense of, of uniformity and unity that they bring to making things happen. We ask for your blessing upon them, Lord, as they celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. We thank you. Or for marriage being a witness to us of, of what what you have with us. You, you've married us. Because you're crazy in love with us. I, I don't get why you're like that, but you are. We thank you for it. And may you continue to enable Paul and Frieda to grow in crazy love for one another. That love that brings out the, the essence of who each of them is. Together they can grow in their knowledge and love of you. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Don't you too? I didn't get to 25. We invite you to stand for the blessing. God give you grace to follow Elizabeth and all the saints in faith and hope and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. This apparently was the Queen's favourite song, hymn. Thank you.